Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. We've got our buddy Bryce Frank. How are we doing, Mick? Doing super. Bryce is a law enforcement officer, uh, law enforcement tactics, uh, tr- uh, firearm trainer, you do defensive training, and then once upon a time you were a uh, national Muay Thai champion yeah. and third in the world. Yes, yeah. I was a uh, United States heavyweight champion, uh, professional United States heavyweight Muay Thai champion, ranked number three in the world. That's fantastic. So you know a little bit about punching people, a little kicking bit, people. A little bit, yeah. Before we even go into that, how would a, a best Muay Thai fighter in the world, best boxer in the world, same weight class, who'd win? Under what rules? God dang it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Street rules. Oh, I, I have to give it to the Muay Thai guy. Okay. Yeah. Boxing rules. The boxer. Woody? Generally. Okay. Yeah, generally. Yeah. All right. But so, you got, you got some guys like, uh, you know, one of the greatest Muay Thai fighters of all time, Samat Pyrakun, was... Uh, World champion in Muay Thai and a world champion in boxing. I didn't know about that. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. So he he was just able to keep his feet down and keep his knees down. He could shut it off. Yeah, he was. You know, he was a real slick fighter. He's what they call a Muay Premier, which is a technical fighter. Okay. Um, You know, very. He's good at fighting backwards. He could. You know, very evasive. Uh, In fact, if you look uh, look him up on YouTube, uh, Samat S A M A R T. I think. uh, look up like Samat 13, 13 punches. You'll okay. see him uh, just evade uh, evade a battery of punches from a guy on the ropes, and just not a single one touches him. Just, you know, just slick. like like he's in the Matrix. Okay. You know? All right. Yeah. So, but that's you know that's pretty rare. But the, he's that that Moy Fermier style fighter that could kind of. Yeah, he's very slick. So Moy Fermier. Moy Fermier. Yeah. So you got three basic styles. There's Moy Fermier, which is the real slick fighter. Okay, uh, a really good vision. Uh, they see very well. Um, good defense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you, modern in the modern area, you see uh, Senchai. If you've ever seen Senchai fight, he's the the one that does the cartwheel kick all the okay, time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, he's one of the real famous ones now. Uh, then there's the uh, Moy Cow, which is a knee a knee fighter, kind okay. of walk up fighters. A lot of clinching, knee and elbow. And then Moy Mat would be somebody who's uh, real boxing heavy, like boxing and like hard low kicks generally. Okay. Which were you? Uh, I s- kind of started as a uh, Moy Mott and I kind of transitioned more into a Moy Vermeer. I, the thing was, you know, I'm kind of fortunate that I understand all three styles very well. Okay. Um, these days, I don't do a lot of sparring anymore. But these days, if I if I spar, I tend to I tend to walk up fight people a little bit because it slows things down. My I vision, see. vision's not so great anymore. So got got your bell rung too yeah, many times. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so how, yeah. how did you, how does a guy decide? Hey, I'm going to go uh, get in the ring and get get to kick and punch people and get punched and kicked. What got you into that? Well, I can tell you how I decided. Okay. Um, so I, you saw a Van Damme movie. Well, I was a big fan, actually a big fan of Chuck Norris movies when I was okay, a kid, right? right, right. So when I was, I think, oh, I don't remember how old I was, but I know my dad took me to see The Octagon with Chuck yes. Norris when I was a little kid. Yeah. So that was, that was i got to take karate, right? And uh, begged and begged and begged, and uh, finally, you know, dad found a, a judo instructor that he liked. So he's like, you, you know, you do, you, you do this. You stick with this, and you can try karate. You know, so I did that for uh, a little bit, uh, judo, and uh, then I think I stuck that out for about a year or so, which mm-hmm. I, whatever our arrangement was. I don't remember, and then went into taekwondo and spent a, a long time doing that. Okay. Um, so, like a lot of people, I thought all that bullshit you see in the movies worked, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, uh, you know, you grow up doing that stuff and you think you know you see chuck norris doing it and all that stuff and you think it's you know this is it's a real deal and then uh this is a 19 i think 1997 i was with some friends at a bar in chicago and uh they had a uh, like kickboxing matches going on in the like in the bar sure and they like, do kind of like tough guy like yeah kind of yeah and they do this kind of like this hey you know you Offering up for people to jump in the ring for I don't know fifty bucks or whatever they were offering. Just bare knuckles, yeah, bare No, it was gloves. Oh, okay. and, yeah, it was it was like American the American rules kickboxing, the above the waist, okay. you know. And so I, my buddies talked me into it, you know, 
and uh, after a few shots, which is always good, right before you get hit in the head. Nice. You know? So you get like <laughs> jeans on, and yeah, and, well, I, I, they, you know, they gave you like shorts or okay, whatever. Okay. Yeah. And so I, you know, I jumped in there and, uh, uh, you know, gloves and shorts, and I and I knocked this guy out in like 50 seconds or something like that. You know, I'm like. I, Awesome at this. <laughs> <laughs> and so then some guy, some, some promoter, is it, you know, guy's a promoter, he's like, hey, hey we, got this fight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, got, we got this we got this fight uh, in Beloit or something, Beloit, Wisconsin or something, you know, in a couple months, why don't you jump in that? Sure. Didn't train, didn't do, you know, just, just like I did. show up. And yeah, just thought I'd show up. And then I, all of a sudden I started running into guys that actually trained a little bit. I'm like, there's, you know, it took took me to lose two or three beatings before I realized, yeah, I need somebody to teach me, teach mm -hmm. me about this stuff. So then I ended up uh, uh, hooking up with uh, Duke Rufus up in Milwaukee, uh, and he was my coach for, for my entire career. That's cool. Yeah. So, I've had that same experience shooting pistols, show, like go shoot like goofy competitions at some club. Not goofy, but... You know, somebody would set up like a combat league, and I'd show up and be like, <laughs> and then I went to like a real USPSA pistol match, yeah. and was like, oh, I, oh, I suck. Shit. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how to do this at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's, that's the only thing I had going for me was I was I was too stupid to realize I wasn't really that good. Mm. So I'm just gonna. I just how old were you? Twenties, uh, early twenties, twenty one, old enough to be at a bar, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 How many know. how many fights have you done? Um, Do you even know? I see. Well, as a as a pro, uh, I had uh, was uh, fourteen and two as a professional kickboxer, and I was two and one as a professional MMA fighter. I, I couldn't tell you how many amateur fights I had. Uh, Fifteen, twenty, something like that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Any, any of them stand out as like uh, I wouldn't wouldn't want to do that one again? No. 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 Um, yeah. I, you know, I I lost fights um, usually. And I'm not trying to take any credit away from any opponents or anything like that, but I, usually I lost fights because of mistakes I made, you know, mistakes in my own preparation or, or tactical mistakes I made in the ring. I never felt like I was thoroughly outclassed by anybody. You know, I never never had that happen where I'm just like, I couldn't beat this guy. You know, I'm sure that guy's out there, but I never had it happen. I know? see. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah, that was that was it for me. I just kind of, you know, enjoyed sticking it out there and getting in there, but memorable, real memorable ones. Um, ironically, the most memorable fight I ever had was the only fight I ever took in my career, which was kind of a, uh, um, so my, my manager had this thing, Duke, he had this thing where it was like, he'd call me and he'd be like, you know, hey, I, I, need, a, I need a huge favor from you. And it was something really insignificant that he needed. You know, hey, forward me that email or whatever. I'm like, okay. You know, he called me, he's like, Hey, I need a small favor. This is like on a Tuesday morning. He calls me and says, hey, I need a small favor. I said, when's the fight? <laughs> he goes, Saturday. I said, it's Tuesday. I'm like way out of shape. Mm -hmm. I had just won the U.S. title, um, you know, a, a couple months before. I hadn't really been training. I'm like, I'm way out of shape, um, you know, not training, I'm heavy. And Was like, it a fight in that same um, <clears throat> uh it was the Muay Thai. Yeah, it was Muay Thai. Okay, yeah. okay. And, uh, and so it was, does that it was, mean that it would be a challenge to your title that match? No, it wasn't. It no. wasn't a title challenge. No, it was. Um, it, was it actually wasn't Muay Thai. It was. It was K one style okay. kickboxing. Okay. But um, you know, so at any rate, I uh, he said, he called me on Tuesday. Can you fight on Saturday? Shit. And then you know he tells me that they're going to give me a pretty good purse for it. So I'm like, all right, I'll be there. Yeah, but what had happened was there was a, a, was a fight coming up, and three guys had gotten hurt. Well, that scrubbed six fights off the card. Okay. You know, kind of last minute. So they were just looking to fill, you know, get fillers. He's like, look, we're going to get a journeyman opponent for you. This is not going to be like a killer. I'm like, all right, good enough. Well, they find this guy was a journeyman boxer. Um, Describe what that means a, to people. A journeyman would be like, a, you know, they're kind of like a professional opponent basically mm -hmm. you know they they kind of go from from place to place and they take fights for a few hundred bucks to to basically you know in boxing there's a lot of that where they'll do things like that to pad records for up and coming okay. pros in the, in the construction world a journeyman means that the person's skilled at their craft right yeah but in in this world it's basically a guy that's good mm -hmm. enough to not 
die but good what? enough to to yeah. maintain this sure this career so a lot of your journeymen are actually relatively talented people but they just careers took a left turn somewhere okay you know and you know some of them just figured it's easier to fight every weekend for 500 bucks and try to find big paydays for you know sure yeah so i, I get this journeyman boxer um and they come up and they say they tell me before the fight in the locker room they're like don't kick him in the legs unless you get in trouble he'll, he'll quit if you kick him in the legs i'm like oh, all right so i go in there and uh start to you know we start moving around and uh come to find out that he was in a locker room with a guy that i had fought about a year earlier and the guy that i fought about a year earlier i broke his leg with leg kicks oh and uh so he's asking he's asking this former opponent of mine hey what do you know about bryce and he looks at him and he's got the you know he's got the real big upper body and the real skinny legs like that type of build right and this guy looks at him and goes Oh, he's gonna murder your life. <laughs> you know, he's like, so the guy's like, now he's getting freaked out, right? And he says, "What should I do?" And he goes, "I just charge him really hard. Don't give him any space." And I said, "All right." So he comes in and he he uh, just comes running across the ring at me, just right? to close on you. Yeah, just like tries to blast me with a front kick, and I I block it, and we end up in a clinch because he closes so hard, and then he pulls his head back and he headbutts me. The ref separates us, admonishes him. It was takes clearly on purpose. Oh, clearly yeah, on yeah. purpose, yeah. And the uh, ref you know, takes a point from him, admonishes him, and I'm bleeding now, right? And, uh, and now these and, legs that yeah. you're not supposed to kick are going to Not yet, kicked. not yet. I didn't go there yet. <laughs> he charges again after the admonishment, you know? And uh, we end up tied up, and I'm kind of just trying to get him off me and push, you know, space, and he's, he's basically trying to wrestle me at this point, you know? Ref separates us again, kind of, because it's, you know, kickboxing, they allow limited clinching. It's not like Muay Thai where they allow the extended clinching. Okay. And the ref's kind of admonishing him again, you know, and, hey, you know, fight clean. And um, so I look over my corner, and Duke says to me, go southpaw, which means left-handed, mm -hmm. right? Because he's charging so hard, I didn't have room to get anything off. And so I, I switch, and I go southpaw, and he charges in a third time. I let a head kick go, left head kick. He's catch him right right across the jaw, drop him along the ropes, and uh, he beats the count. So he gets up on the on the eight count, you know, and uh, he's yelling at the ref. He goes, that <laughs> kicked me in the face. <laughs> I'm like, well, it's kickboxing. There we go. <laughs> right, right, right. That's and, hilarious. Uh, yeah, Did he so not realize that that was? Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just maybe most of his other opponents didn't have the ability to get their leg up that high. Or yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he, he knew it was a kickboxing fight. Okay. He'd done other f fights before. I, I don't know what the deal was. I, I think. <laughs> yeah, so he. Yeah. What the refs say? Well, he's just the refs like. What? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. within the rules, you know. And and so uh, he charges again, and uh, I catch him with a I catch him with like a left hook. And he goes down and he grabs me around the legs and he's holding on to my legs. Like on his and, knees? Yeah, he's on his knees and he's like holding on to my legs. Like he's trying to shoot a double almost, right? And so I, I, I'm kind of pushing his head down and I kind of step up out of his grasp, you know, and this ref's trying to pull just us push apart. Push him down to the mat? Yeah, I did. I just shoved the back of his head down. But then, you know, I'm wearing tie trunks, right? Boxing trunks. And so my, now my trunks come down, so my ass is showing to the whole crowd. You know? nice. So now I'm sitting there trying to get my shorts up with a gloved hand on, right? And ref admonishes him again. He's like, hey, one more, you know, one more foul, and you're, you're out of here. You're done. And so then he, you know, we restart again. He, he comes in again, and um, he, you know, I think he tried to pick me up and throw me or something. I don't, I don't remember. We, you know, we... But he, the ref, no, I, I hit him again. I hit him with an uppercut. That's what it was. And he went down again. He grabbed my legs again. And he wouldn't let go. And now I'm trying to step out. And he's got a good grasp on me. And the ref's trying to pull him off. And he won't let go. And and so the ref's waving the fight off, you know. And and uh, he finally gets us separated. And the guy's like, he's coming at me. And he's like trying to swing around the ref to try to hit me. He's and angry. He's screaming at me and me and everything. And, you know, and... Uh, 
I'm like, well, I don't know. The guy still wants to fight. We'll still fight. So I let go with an uppercut and a hook and flattened him right in the middle of the <laughs> ring after the bell. And his corner jumps into the ring. My corner jumps into the ring. Security jumps in the ring. You know? Oh, man. And so this was this, this, like, this favor that I did you know, for the promoter, like, let's do a, just, yeah, get in, get a quick win, it won't be anything. And it turned into this it big... It turned into this, and I would, I will still to this day, if I'm up at a fight in Milwaukee, get asked about that fight. You know, really? People, yeah, still to this day, people, oh, uh, it was right after Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin fought mm -hmm. on Spike TV, and Stefan Bonner was front row, and he came running up to me after the fight, that's when, you know, he and I met at that, that night, and he came running up to me after the fight, and he's like, that was incredible, that was a cool... <laughs> <laughs> but after the thing was over, I have to watch that. After the thing was over, I ripped the the uh, uh, mic away from the ring announcer. You know, when he was announcing me the winner by disqualification, I took the mic away from him and I started basically cutting a WWE like a pro wrestling style promo on this guy. <laughs> you know, like hey, you know, we're gonna finish this in the parking lot, and I, which I was that was bullshit. And yeah, I was yeah. just playing to the crowd at that point in time. But it took me forty five minutes to get from the ring. Back to the locker room. That's just funny. Everyone was like, "Hey, let's take a picture. Hey, sign something." You know, it was just one of those. It ended up being this. This, this one-off thing ended up being like the most entertaining. Certainly entertaining. Did he come and apologize it. or anything? No. No. Did never. you ever talk to him again? No. Never saw him again. Never saw him again. Yeah. That's the hilarious. only thing I can think of is maybe he thought it would be more honorable to go out and like, you know. Trying. Get disqualified <laughs> than to go out and get knocked get out. out. Yeah, that's the only thing I can that's think hilarious. of. That's hilarious. You're talking earlier. You uh, used to train with Pat Militage, one of the the legends of MMA and uh, UFC, and you said that he had a T-shirt. Yeah. So um, you know, when I say Pat, train with Pat Militage, I want to be clear on this. I was, you know, I was with Pat for a few months. Okay. That was it. It wasn't like you know, Duke was the Duke was the uh, really, you know, the guy that sure. trained me. But uh, Pat was the guy that introduced me to, you know, to, to real fighting. Sure, right? sure. Full contact fighting, to kickboxing, to grappling, to that type of stuff. I was living in the Quad Cities, and Pat wasn't even in the UFC yet. You know, it was before he was even in the UFC. Mid-90s? Uh, yeah, yeah, like mid-90s, probably 95, I think. He was teaching out of the basement of uh, Nick Tarpon's karate school down there. Um, and... Uh, you know, I don't think even, I don't think Matt Hughes is even around yet. Just ran into him. Did you? Where was I? I was in Iowa having dinner after class, mm -hmm. and I look out, and I'm like, that's Matt Hughes. Okay. And I walked out and said hi yeah. and took a picture with him. Cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, I, I met Pat, and uh, he's a great, you know, great guy, real gracious guy, and, you know, um, but he had a shirt, yeah, the shirt you asked me about was, uh, uh, but it's something he sold in his gym. Yeah, it was a shirt. They, they, I don't know, if they sold it or some of the guys wore it. It said your, uh, just like a black shirt and then, you know, Militich fighting systems or whatever it said, and it said uh, in block letters across it, your kung fu is no good here. Yeah. And what was he? What was his? I know why, but mm -hmm. just tell tell the listeners, viewers, what was what was Pat's uh, intention there? What was he thinking? Well, I think that, you know, there's so much. Uh, there's just bullshit out there in the martial arts community, mm -hmm. right? On what on what works and what doesn't. What and about if I told you that I know things that I just can't show you? I can't show you not because they're secret, but if I actually tried them on you, you'd kill me. I'd probably kill you, or I'd yeah. castrate you, blind yeah. you, make you deaf, yeah, give you a stroke or sure. a heart attack, dim mock style. Right? Shit. Yeah. Well, it's I think you know our friend Paul Sharp likes to say, if you can't beat me with the rules, you can't beat me without the rules, right? Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been been in my share of scraps. You think I've never been gouged in the eye? You think I've sure. never been hit in the nuts? You know, sure, sure. I mean... Hey, can, wait, you can fight through getting hit in the nuts? It's a crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> crazy, yeah, you know. It's, so wait, telling, telling you, uh, your daughter or wife, just hit them in the nuts and run away, that won't work? No, I don't, you know, I think that's really dangerous. I mean, you know, it's one of the first things I almost expect from people, yeah. in a, you know, in a street fight type situation is that I'm going to, you know, they're going to try to hit you in the nuts. Right. It's almost the first thing you expect, you know. And I'm not saying it's, look, any striking, okay, and not just eye gouges or nut shots, you know, they, they to a degree, they did, they depend on, you know, how much pain the person feels, mm -hmm. you know. That's why I'm, you know, as much of a striker as I am and as much as I love striking, I tell people all the time that your hand-to-hand 
self-defense base should be built on grappling. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you know, a little striking to fill it in. Do the opposite of what I did. You know, because I was a striker for many, many years, and now, you know, now I'm trying to play catch up with the mm-hmm. grappling. Yeah, you just came. You won uh, silvers in an IBJJF tournament yesterday. Up yeah, in, up in up in uh, St. Paul. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, so I'm I'm kind of kind of perpetually silver in IBJJF. My last three IBJJFs have all been silver. So uh, I never yet won a, a grappling tournament, and I had the same issue in kickboxing. I never won a kickboxing tournament. Hmm. I was perpetually in silver. Yeah, well, in second place. Are you but, doing it to win, or are you doing it to learn the skill? I'm doing and, it to win. Are you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, yeah. I want to have fun. Yes, I want to learn. Yes, I. But I want to win too. Sure. You know? Winning's fun. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So um, go go back go back to the kung fu thing, and we're not talking about kung fu in general. Yeah. Why is it? I have a story I tell sometimes. When I was a teenager, my dad had a friend that was a black belt in one of the Eastern martial arts. Mm-hmm. I don't know which one: Hapkido, Aikido, one of those things. Sure. Nice guy, mm-hmm. and I think he was like multiple level black belt. Mm-hmm. And my dad's like, Mickey likes to scrap. You know, show him some stuff. Yeah. And, and and we squared off in the living room with our shoes off, yeah. and he tried to kick me, and I took him down, and yeah. I'm like, oh, that was silly. Like I don't, know, I must have like caught him funny. Yeah. And he got up and like dusted himself off, and it happened like four times in a row, and I, I didn't really know anything. Sure. And I'm like, okay, well that's goofy. Yeah. You know, like and it just at that point in my mind it was like, oh, that's that whole like <coughs> black belt thing. Yeah. Doesn't. It's kind of bullshit sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I think the problem is that, you know, I don't, I don't think the problem is necessarily some of those martial arts, but the way they train, uh, right? You know, so they don't they don't train with any resistance, any real resistance. Mm-hmm. Nothing's pressure tested. Like, so it's not the you know, strike that it doesn't it doesn't have any efficacy or effect. It's it's the manner in which they train that strike. Yeah, generally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, generally. You know, sometimes it's. Sometimes it's what they're teaching too. You know, when you start, to, you know, when there was the Gracie explosion, right? Mm-hmm. You'd start to see these. If you picked up a martial arts magazine or something, you'd see, uh, you know, all the the hidden the hidden ground fighting yeah, techniques yeah. of yeah, yeah. Taekwondo. You're know, like, what? Right, right, <laughs> you know? right, right. No, yeah, that's that's bullshit. You know, but um, but it's not. Yeah, you know, you can learn to kick and punch and in any of those arts, but if, they're t- if it's not done under pressure, right? Pressure test, like mm-hmm. like you know, our friend Craig Douglas talks mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're not pressure testing it, it's not you know, you don't know. Mm-hmm. You, know, you mm-hmm. don't know what you don't know, right? My buddy Aaron Cooper. I don't think we had Cooper on. I don't think, I don't think so. so. No. Coop, I told you earlier, was one of the founders of the Army Combatives Program, and he refers to a lot of that as a broken rhythm training. Yeah. You know, like. All right, I'm going to do this, and then I want you to do this, and then I'm going to do this. Yeah. No, no, stop. You're going too fast. Let me do this to you. Right, and yeah. Like, what are you actually learning when there's, I'm not teaching you this, but talking to the folks listening, when there's no legitimate resistance, we assume, like, is the bad guy in reality going to just sit there and, wait, what do you want me to do, sir? You want me to hold my arm like this? Right, with the yeah. <laughs> yeah, like the old Jim Carrey. Right, right, like, right, 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 right. me wrong. Right, yeah. right. Stop. You're going yeah. too fast. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think that... Well, that, that was the one where he... <laughs> yeah, the, the knife. Yeah. The, the he had blood. Did you yeah. ever see that, Drew? It, <laughs> it was, did, it, it was yeah. uh, in living it color. Fun. Yeah, he yeah. did a... Uh, he was a karate instructor, yeah. and he was teaching the girls self-defense, and he gave them, like, a real knife. Yeah. I think a gun, maybe, too. I think it was just a knife. Okay, yeah, yeah. and they stabbed him to hell, and he basically was bleeding to death. Like they went too yeah. fast to. Right. Yeah, it was goofy. They, like most beginners, you attack me wrong. It was that kind was of like that. the precursor to uh, our friend uh, 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 Master Ken. Yeah. 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 Keep going. No, he's yeah. His skits are great, Master Ken. Yeah. So it's not. I don't think it's the art. I think it's the you know or the, or the way they punch and kick. It's just the the lack of of pressure testing. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's really what. And some of the training methodologies too are pretty stupid sometimes. You know. Um, you know, we're learning a lot more about that stuff with sports science and everything, mm-hmm. you know, and how how people learn and how to, and, you know how to make things stick effectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so you're talking about this, the the psychology <clears throat> of learning. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like uh, you know, like in like the 30s, 40s in America, there was boxing mm-hmm. and wrestling, and that was it. And then soldiers started bringing home judo. Yeah. Judo and jujitsu from from 
uh, World War II, yep. and guys that know a few tosses or throws. Like, you ever read the Hardy Boy novels as a kid? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Like, well, w the boys knew judo. Yeah. And then these books were written in the 50s, and yeah. like, oh my God, teenage boys that know judo. Yeah. And they were, you know, they were like sexy detective boys that had Corvettes or convertibles. Right. I was so envious of those bastards. <laughs> but they knew a couple judo throws, so yeah. as such, they won every fight with the bad guys. Yeah. yeah. But well, I think, wasn't. Uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was big into jiu-jitsu and judo, I think. Didn't they? know that. I believe so, yeah. Didn't know that. I'll have to read that. I've read quite a bit about his life. I didn't know yeah. that. I'm, um, I'm going to research that right now, actually. Yeah, yeah I Let's believe he was. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh... wonder... Well, that he would have had the ability to do some travels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was certainly upwardly mobile, right? So... Why then do people, instructors, mm -hmm. uh, guys that go out, get a black belt in XYZ mm -hmm. art, and then they put up a school? Yeah. Why are mm -hmm. they passing on this stuff that doesn't make people more effective at protecting themselves? Uh, well, I don't know if they always know, right? I mean, I think one of the big problems with any, any martial art, even the effective ones, is what you start to see after a while is, you know, you saw this with, um, you know, I think you're starting to see this with jujitsu a little bit now. Um, is it becomes a sport, and people start becoming competitive in that sport, right? And uh, so you start seeing a lot of jujitsu that is designed to beat other jujitsu. Mm -hmm. It's you know, not designed to beat bad dudes, right? Yeah, yeah. A guy that, a guy that, <clears throat> it's a dance. Yeah. yeah, and so then you you know you get yes they are pressure testing and they're working against work. Uh, you know, Lively resisting, resisting opponents and all this stuff. You see it with boxing. You see it with Muay Thai. I think, I think you see it with everything. Is you know you go into most Muay Thai gyms, and you're going to learn Muay Thai in the context of dealing with someone else who's doing it to you or trying to do it to you, mm -hmm. right? You Here's know, how you, he's going to kick. Here's yeah. how the strike's going to. Right. You know, you go into Jiu Jitsu and you learn Jiu Jitsu a lot of times in the context of. Here's what other jujitsu people mm -hmm. are going to try to do to you. Not the guy that's going to bum rush you sure. and just try to tackle you on the living room floor four times. You know, my my you know. jujitsu is limited. Uh, while I practice it on and off for fifteen or eighteen <clears throat> years, I, I'm I'm limited. But my uh, my brain, like I'm always talking about this with Paul and other guys, I'm always looking like no matter where we're at on the on the in the scrap, like where can I hit them? Yeah, where can I hit them right now? Where can I? put my elbow into their eye socket right now like yeah. and, and well that's not what we're doing but that's right. what i'm doing that's what i'm thinking <laughs> that's, that's why i'm that's, here uh, what what's chris howder say right uh train think think street train sport practice yeah. the art you know you should always you know you don't need to, you don't need to train that all the time you don't need to train like oh well I'm, you know what if i were hitting you and stuff all that you don't need that all the time you know it's, it's just kind of like the gun grappling like the ecqc type yeah. stuff you know uh, a just, little bit of that will go along. What I'm saying is, it's just in my head, like mm -hmm. right there. If his, if he had a weapon on his yeah. belt, he could access it. Right. I can't do a damn thing. Yeah, about no, you're thinking. It. Yeah, you're just looking things. at that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. I 100% agree with that. You know, my point is, you don't need to. You know, every time you go grapple, you don't need to put blue guns on and. Sure, you know, because you do need to practice the yeah. the, the mechanics yeah. of the the yeah. craft. Yeah, and then you know you you develop your jujitsu, you develop your striking, and then once in a while you need to say, "Hey, how is this going to look in an austere environment?" Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that you know that that should be enough. You know, uh, there's a you know big debate about there. You know, about, about every week I'll read something somewhere from some combatives guy. You know about how training for sport will get you killed in the street. You know, mm -hmm. like well, you know I. I trained only for a ring for a long time. And, and in that time period, because of my job working in a fairly large jail at the time, you know, I was in a lot of r real fights. You know, with inmates? With inmates, and yeah. And I never, never once did training for the ring get me killed in a cell block. Sure. You know? In fact, it was usually very easy to overcome largely unskilled people. Sure. Yeah. You know? Aaron Cooper, I bring him up again. <clears throat> We come out the room out there and we spar around and hit mitts a little bit. Mm -hmm. Can I get a little more? Thanks. Oh, I'd like some coffee too, Drew. Appreciate that. Brought the coffee pot down. Yeah, yeah it was a long night. So. 
back from Minneapolis till two in the morning. So yeah, I'm I'm uh, nursing a little bit of a hangover here this morning. All right, thanks, sir. Thanks, Drew. No problem. Coop always says like like I'll say, man, I, I freaking suck at this. Like we'll finish a fifteen minute pad session, mm -hmm. and he'll go, well. I'd rather you know how to throw two or three combos than not, and that and this isn't like a just learn some minimum level and call it good. But dudes that spend ten hours a month hitting mitts right. are probably doing a lot more than ninety nine percent of the men walking around the Absolutely, streets. Absolutely, yeah. And that's was it's kind of his point. It's not a just do that and do it uh, from time to time and call yourself good. But right. Yeah. Just that alone mm -hmm. separates you. Having yeah. having that uh, little bit of uh, subconscious memory of seeing fists coming at your face right. for a couple hours a month. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a big, you know, as Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan to like, get punched in the face, right? Yeah, and a uh, little bit of a uh, little bit of force can can really mm -hmm. know, overwhelm people mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. And if you if you don't ever put yourself in those environments, you know, you're not gonna. You're not going to know how to respond. Exposure equals composure. It's our, our buddy Z likes to say that. I like that. Yeah. I'm going to steal more, that from you. The more, well, you don't have to steal it. Uh -huh. you, you can use it. But, uh, yeah, the more you're exposed to a thing. I always tell students, like, when we're shooting, like, uh, talking about the uh, uh, sport training, get you killed in real violence. I talk to friends of mine, like my buddy Les Keys Martoni. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know Les, Les yeah. from the gym. You know, who's not? He's got his blue belt in jiu-jitsu. Nice. Uh, he... You know, nationally ranked shooting competitor, grandmaster shooter, can take like guys like us and make us look like we're four year olds with a cap gun with a right. pistol. Yeah. yeah, but that's not real. Okay, you go into a parking lot and get in a gunfight with a guy that can shoot in at his level and see yeah. who wins. Yeah, you know what you know what Les can do? Les can put rounds on target very fast yeah. and very accurately yeah, yeah. under pressure. Under pressure while yeah. moving. Yeah. While while uh uh there's a, a constant evolving scenario. Yeah. But that's not the same as reality. What well, makes him a shit ton better than yeah. somebody that can't do that. Right, exactly. Yeah. Does he think that that skill won't translate at all? Come on, that's yeah. ridiculous. In fact, you know? well, that's, you know, I've been talking about some books back here. Uh, Jordan, uh, who else? Jordan, he, he, his whole group of um, co-workers, they were all competitive shooters. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, who else do I have down here? Maybe nobody. Uh Cirillo, Jim mm -hmm. Cirillo from New York. He was like, uh, one, him and his group of New York City cops were like national champion police shooters. Yeah. All those uh, old gunfighters from back in the day to present, almost yeah. all of them are yeah. are competitive shooters. And now to this day, like guys like uh, or Cooper, Colonel yeah. Cooper that founded Gunsight and was kind of involved with all the modern pistol revolution. <laughs> He created what became IPSC and yeah. USPSA. He thought that this is what you got to do, vet, yeah. vet, vet the stuff. If it doesn't work right. out on the Saturday afternoon with your buddies, it yeah. probably is meaningless. Yeah, and, and just, just that pressure, too, to feel mm -hmm. that pressure. Even if it's just the pressure to perform in front of your friends. You know? Yeah. I remember... Uh, That's not the same. You know, uh, you know Matt Little, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, I remember Matt talking about... Uh, Matt's been on. Yeah, and, and I remember Matt talking about, uh, you know... Oh, his his history, you know. Just so you guys songs. listening, uh, Green Beret, big city SWAT cop for a major U.S. city, and then uh, now a master class U.S. PSA shooter. Right. Yeah. So he's you know he's he's been there. He's done that. Mm -hmm. And then I remember him talking about uh, um, first time he ever did this. Like a regional. I don't even know if it was a regional match. It might have even just been like it a was local, local match. one at Alpha. Yeah, just a local match. And he's like, God, I'm more nervous for this than like. He's, anything or, he and I talked know, about that in the yeah. podcast. He said he felt more stress and had more uh, pressure internally to perform than he ever did kicking a door down or being in a live gunfight. Yeah, I think part of that is that people uh, look at a guy like that and they always oh, agree. Bray's a SWAT cop. He let's yeah. see what. He, oh, you yeah. suck. You're not yeah. as good as these uh, IT guys. Yeah, these that, computer programmers. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Our friend Z. He and I talk about that often. Yeah. Uh, Excellent shooter, not a competitive shooter, but the thing that <coughs> that a guy like 
him or Matt does is they execute each time effectively. It might not yeah. be like the fastest or flashiest, right. but they do it. But they get it done. And there's no sweat running down their face, right. and they're not yeah. shaky and losing their shit. They mm -hmm. can meter their heart rate and yeah. and keep themselves composed. Yeah, just that stress response, you know, putting yourself in that, you know, if for nothing else, that's a great reason to jump into competition. Mm -hmm. You know, you, guys, you don't have to go jump into a ring somewhere against a professional fighter, you know, go, go into a, a a local shooting match, go into a, a you know a small grappling tournament, just something where you're going to go against that person who's who's going to go at you 100, mm -hmm. you know, and you're going to risk failing in front of your family and friends. Yeah, you know, it's that's huge. You know, we just talked about that. Drew and I just did <laughs> class, and we had a group of guys, and I was trying to impress that upon them. You're nervous now cool keep going because the guy that's literally if you had to draw your gun there was some cops in the class you're doing it because there's some somebody trying to hurt you or somebody else mm -hmm. so would you not be any more nervous than this right like so if this is causing you to stop and be like time out yeah 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 if you can't push yourself push through yourself that through that exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's the, getting just getting facing that you know, the fear of public failure is, is huge, you mm -hmm. know, I just like... Especially we for about, dudes. Yeah, we were talking about the uh, doing the Twin Cities Open yesterday, you know, and I'm getting ready to walk out on, on the mat for a match, and I'm like, I'm nervous, I can feel my heart racing and everything like that, and I've done this how many times, yeah. you know, in front of thousands of people, not the hundreds of people that were in that gym, but it's still... You know, there's people here that expect something of me. There you know? is a, a lot of stories of, like, musicians, actors, comedians. I forgot which comedian. To this day, I was watching, uh, like, a documentary. Somebody that you, we'd all know their name. They go puke. Mm -hmm. Not They don't make themselves. They get so nervous that they vomit yeah. before they go on stage or to perform, and they've done it. For, yeah, for years and years. The, the overachievement. Have you ever read the book Overachievement? I haven't. Yeah, look up, look that one up. I apologize, I don't recall the author's name right now, but the name of the book is Overachievement. That one made a big impression on me because you know um, he's a performance psych. The guy that wrote it's a performance psychologist. Okay. You know, and uh, what he talks in there about is and I, you know I'm, I'm it's been a while, so I apologize if I'm a little off on some of this, but what he talks about in there is a lot of performance psychology is is focused wrong is we spend so much time trying to calm people down and the best performers don't calm down they just accept they the accept nerves yeah. they just say this is part of me my this is part of the process of me getting ready you know and uh, I think we, you and I were talking about that earlier I think it was before we were recording but you know my first few fights were just you know were terrible until I realized you know I'd start having this you know two weeks before a fight I'd start looking like dog shit in the gym you know, and then I'd start head checking myself. I'm like, I suck. I'm no good, right? And then uh, finally realized that no, that's just what happens to me two weeks mm -hmm. before a fight. You're going to be fine on fight night. Yeah. You know? And once I realized because you that, put in the work, doing the correct repetitions, you know, and yeah, I was letting you know for the two weeks building up to the fight, I was letting the nerves in the gym get to me. Yeah. You know that the. the the immediacy of the event was getting to me, you mm -hmm. know, psychologically. But then once I understood that that was, for me, that was just part of the process. You're going to look like shit for two weeks in the gym before the fight. Don't sweat it, you know, and just show up on fight night. And one, of the, one of the things we adopted in our, our program, we talk quite a bit about that. We, we talk about, we as a training society, we talk about overcoming stress. Yeah. And that, I think, is what you're talking about. We don't need to overcome it. We need to work with it. Yeah, accept it. Yeah, Z, uh, the, the fifth, fifth Special Forces group has a uh, guy that works with them. You guys can follow him on Instagram. Doc Hun is his name, and he's a sports psychologist. And, okay. and uh, uh, I, Z and I have talked about this to the point that we've put it in our written curriculum. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where the exposure equals composure comes from. But it's like a just whatever the stress response is, like, I've got to puke, I'm going to shit myself, my heart's pounding. Right. Uh, accept it in the sense of, this is pretty cool. This is my body literally getting ready to yeah. fight a tiger yeah. or, or climb into a burning building. Right. And 
think about it in the context of this is really cool. I'm getting like some superhuman speed and strength out of this. Right. And a byproduct is that my heart's pounding because it yeah. needs the blood to get to my eyes and brain and my lungs are thumping right. because I need to keep the oxygen. And so you just start to like define what's happening and then it takes away the, the scary part of it. I think a lot of dudes though think I should be calm and I'm just it causes anxiety then because yeah. they don't like that stress. It, yeah, exactly. They're not used to feeling that, yeah. you know. And you you only get that when you put yourself out there, mm -hmm. you know, in, in some way, you know. And yeah, got, it could be it could be know. going on a sales call. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, you know, going to a, a Toastmasters club mm -hmm. or you know something. Yeah. You know. Speaking in front of people used to cause me total anxiety. Oh, I yeah. talk to students all the time about that. Like I had to do a thing. The people listening have heard me say it before, but I just talked to a group of like five or eight hundred people for a political thing. I had to talk for like a minute. Yeah. And I, whatever, yeah, I'll do it. I had to introduce somebody, and about a minute before, five minutes before, I sweat. And I go in the bathroom yeah, to clean the, myself. Where's the up. back door of this place? I literally right? had a yeah. whole conversation in front of the mirror. I'm just yeah. going to go tell the guy that I'm supposed to introduce that I'm not feeling well. I'm going to go home, and then I've got started to get calm. I'm going to have a couple beers. I don't need to be here. I'm an yeah. adult. They can't make me stay here. And I had right. this whole dialogue, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and it was like, then you'll always do that. Right. And I went and did it, and in my in my head, my voice was like, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. But everybody said it sounded fine. Yeah. But that was like a turning point in my own head that sure. that's my fight or flight response was saying, just get away from this situation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, it's, yeah, you got to confront those things, you know, and take them head on. And, or run like a bitch. Yeah. Or do that. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I, I'm a huge, huge believer in that. And, and it, you know, again, it doesn't have to be some, you know, you know, big pro fight or anything, just yeah. something. You know, there's a, there's a whole job. group of uh, psychologists and therapists now using um, fear inoculation to help people through anxiety and stress. Sure. Do, yeah. a, do a, a ropes course or a zip yeah. line or, you know, things like that that you're, you're fearful of. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know the psychology behind this, but I sometimes wonder if, you know, our, we, we live such relatively comfortable lives mm -hmm. nowadays that, you know, our fight, our, our fight or flight uh, responses are kicked off by you know really very mundane things. Right, somebody you honks know? at you in traffic, yeah, and yeah, and you know you're not, and we kind of a lot of times live in this really just this constantly stressed out state. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you know, these these types of responses were designed to get us away from tigers and shit. Right, right, right. 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 Yeah, yeah. Fight the fight yeah. the 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 Mongol hordes coming over the the hillside. Right. Yeah. That's. By the way, before I forget, you were correct about uh, uh, the jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. yeah, and judo. Yeah. And actually, as soon as I read the guy's name he trained with, I think I remember reading that in one of the books about him. I okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a, he was a tough man. Yes, he was. That was actually like his whole... He wasn't supposed to make it to adulthood by the science that they had at that time. At that time, yeah. yeah. His, if you guys haven't read about Teddy Roosevelt, you should. His, if his parents weren't wealthy, he probably would have died. His, the, his asthma attacks had come. His father had put him in a carriage. Did you ever read about this? <laughs> Not, I don't recall reading about this. His dad had put him in a carriage. Like, it could be 2 in the morning and his mm -hmm. asthma would be happening. And they didn't understand. But his dad would put him in the carriage and they'd go race around the, the streets, mm -hmm. whipping the horses to force air into his lungs oh, to yeah. help him breathe. Yeah. But that was his whole life, was forcing himself to do things yeah. to make himself stronger. Yeah. Yeah, that was built like that resilience. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like, uh, and he kind of did everything. Yeah, yeah. including jujitsu and yeah, boxing too. I think. Yeah, yeah. He, he was big into boxing. Also. Yeah. There's yeah. some there's stories about him that sound like they are written right out of like an old west novel. Yeah. Like there's a one where he goes, uh, some guys were cattle rustling, mm -hmm. and he rounded up a posse because he had a cattle ranch in the Dakotas, and went and like took it to this guy and literally got in a scrap with him and the whole town saw it and then everybody respected him because he stood up to the big bad guy wow. but yeah. nobody else would and they thought he was a dork with his glasses <laughs> yeah. and, and he he got after it yeah but he uh forced himself to do those things and knowing i'm gonna die anyway so right. i might as well like yeah. live a good life absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Well, everything's temporary right <laughs> for sure for sure, which is you know kind of cool talking to, what, with a guy like you. Uh, oh, well, 
Bryce will always be able to take care of himself because of his physical training. What happens when you're 80? Yeah, eventually you can. Right. Yeah, eventually you can. Right. I mean, it might, it might not even be then. You know. Sure. <laughs> you get sure. run over by a car today. Well, I meant you know? more of like a physical, from like yeah. a physical uh, uh, violence perspective. Like so you have to train more than just a certain thing. Mm -hmm. I, I've quoted this many a time. I forgot the exact quote, but uh, the Battle of Otho. Uh, as our as our might lessens, our heart and mind must grow bolder. Yeah. He, the author was basically saying to these old warriors, like as you get, as you, your body ages, you yeah can't rely on the sword anymore. You got to be smarter and you sharper. Be smarter, yeah. Yeah. Age and treachery will overcome youth and vigor. Who said that? I don't know. Me just now. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> that was that was that was that was plaque worthy. Yeah. Say that again. Age and treachery will overcome youth and vigor. Did you really just come up with that? No, I did not really oh. just come up with that, but I don't know where it came from. Oh, it's one of those things that rolls around in the back of my head sometimes. That's a good yeah. one. Yeah. That's a good one. I'm going to write that down. There's the title right there, bro. Age yeah. and treachery? Age and treachery will overcome youth and vigor. That's what you said, right? That's what I said. It's kind of like the uh, be, beware of the old man in a... Mm -hmm. Business where, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, the one time. Not, yeah, 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 not many old men. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 super true. Yeah. Well, and that's I think the difference between uh, the sport and street stuff is the mindset part of it. Uh, yes, I think so. A little bit, you know. There's, there's. I don't mean the difference in the sense of like the mechanical skills. Yeah. But if the person is not training with that mindset to. Yeah. To understand that, yeah, you know, what I do in here in the dojo on the mat might need some modifications for out there. Yeah, because I'm not going to stand up and high five and right. say, yeah, slap know, hands, bump knuckles. Let's yeah. Go. yeah, yeah, yeah. A little different when your first indication of violence is getting hit in the head from behind. Yeah, or, exactly. Or tackled yeah. into an ATM yeah. or feeling a knife or muzzle pressed against your back. Right. Yeah, it's a whole different hey, story. Hey, you didn't yeah. give me a heads yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, that's not fair. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, it might not come head on. Yeah, so absolutely. And you know, you know, that was the biggest thing about. You know, I don't think those types of situations, those spontaneous kinetic events like that, those street fights or whatever, they, I don't think they are very stressful because there's no time for them to be stressful, right? They just happen. You know. Um, but you hear that a lot from people. Mm -hmm. It was surreal. Yeah. 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 And even if you're, you know, if you have good awareness and, and everything, you know, it's still, you, you might have seconds to process that yeah. something's going to happen. You don't have three months to process. Go into it. the awareness that you just did. What did you? What oh, the, you? the air quotes? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, you know, um, I think it's, no, well, I don't think it's Craig Douglas that talks about that. You know, you can't, you can't aware something. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a verb. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we talk about it like mm -hmm. it's a verb. Yeah. You know, um, are you know? It, you just tell people to be aware is not you know. That's that's pretty non-specific. Like, let's give some people some. Those are concrete, shoelaces. I'm aware of them. Right. Yeah. yeah. Let's give some people some concrete strategies for being aware. Right. Some things that you can do. You know, um, habits that you can build. Yeah. You know. Um, Even the placing yourself in spaces and places like I only sit with my back to the wall in yeah. a restaurant. Well, what happens if the bad guy comes out of the kitchen right and not exactly. the front door yeah yeah what if yeah. he comes out of the bathroom what if it's the dude next to you that's sick of his wife bitching at him and stands up and yeah. flips the table over <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah there's so you know I, yeah I, I just well, it's good to talk, I think it's good to talk about we yeah. talk about that in class quite a bit like we don't teach like range scanning mm -hmm. not that you shouldn't but you can't be aware of something that we know is not there. You can't be aware of a potential threat on a gun range when we know that we're safe right. and that we are totally in control of the area. But you can be aware of making sure your co-trainees are safe. You can be aware of where I'm at. You yeah. can be aware of the bird that just flew by. Right. But, yeah. you get but a like, lot of times it just becomes, who is it that uh, uses the term range theatrics? Pat McNamara. Pat Mac yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it becomes a lot of times, right? Just range theatrics, you know. And like you wouldn't get in the ring, and this is a, a stretch, but you wouldn't get in the ring and, and be striking with an opponent and then check your six. No, because yeah. you know, in yeah. this context, that's the only yeah, thing I got to deal that's with. The only problem I have right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, in a in an austere environment, you you know, you should think about things like that, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of times bad guys do work in pairs, you mm -hmm. know. 
And you know, I'm a big believer in, in, in making things simple uh, and developing the simple strategies. You know, when, when I teach, I teach everything kind of in threes and fours because that's how I remember things. Okay. Yeah. You know, Give me an example. So, well, let's awareness, right? Okay. So, um, and, I, and I didn't invent any of this stuff. I'm not claiming to have invented any of this stuff, but uh, you know. Um, one of the things when I teach awareness to people in, in uh, self-defense settings and stuff like that is, you know, is num you know, number one, look into a space before you enter it. William Maple talks about mm -hmm. this all the time, right? Get as much information about that space as you can before you actually walk into it, right? Number two, when you get into that space, assess for noise and orderliness, right? Number three, identify exits. And number four, Identify something in that space you could turn into a weapon if you had to. You know, it's a four-step process. That, well, you, yeah, you, you brought them with you. Yeah. So, you know, and uh, you know, and this comes from you know guys like William Maple, mm -hmm, guys like mm -hmm. Paul Sharp, you know, Craig Douglas, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of other really sure. smart people out there. I, not too. to take anything away from any one of them, I guarantee you, some Roman century thought like this. Absolutely. Some yeah. sam some yeah. some samurai thought like this. Some yeah. Mongol thought like that. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. And, and that's you know, and that's the thing is those. That that lived did right yeah yeah there, there's a big yeah I'm, I'm sure you've heard it there's a big thing in the, you know in training about citing people and citing sources and all that type and i agree with that generally you should cite sources that's a new can, thing but, because there's explosion of this and i want f credit yeah yeah well you know it, it's like am i at some point in time look everything came from someone else right, right. You know, Unless I came up with it, unless you invented it yourself. Yeah, I, mean, I yeah. think it all came from you. Actually. Side note, real quick on that, I just was reading something about Les. Mm -hmm. Les the other day got something on his Instagram account. So if any of you want to look this up, Les Keys Martoni, Les Pepperoni on Instagram, Les Pepperoni. He's showing. He used to use Coach's Eye before I saw anybody using Coach's Eye for mm -hmm. shooting. Yeah. It used to always be used for like basketball and, and mm -hmm. uh, 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 golf swings and stuff. Yeah. He didn't invent it, but he's just like, hey, let me use this. Yeah. So he shows a video of his draw stroke in the coach's eye. And this is, again, a grandmaster shooter that's like the top fraction of 1% of pistol shooters on the planet. Right. Some guy chimes in with like a bunch of advice on how he can clean course, up his draw yeah. stroke. Les is a gentleman. Yeah. And, and I'm like, I wrote like, do tell. Like, I want to yeah. hear what you got. It could have been good. Yeah. And he goes into this whole thing about how, you know, it, it was dumb. So I go look at the stuff he's putting online and almost everything. I've coined the term. Yeah. I've coined this phrase. I've coined yeah. this. And, and you look like, you dumb son of a bitch. Like, the stuff you're saying barely makes sense, but yeah. now you've trademarked, like, two words. Like, yeah. like yeah. anyway. No, yeah, just, the, yeah, the, the citing, it's, it's, uh, in, and I get it, and I, you know, I like Duke Rufus, huge mentor of mine. You know, I cite him all the time. Paul, you know, Paul sure. That's what you learned you know? it from. I yeah. mean, just in the last five minutes, yeah. I've said Paul's name, Z's name. Yeah. Uh, uh, who else did we say? Craig. We talked about Craig. Craig. We talked about, about William. William April. Yeah. 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 So it's and because that's where we've heard it, or that's where yeah. we we know it. Doc Hun from yeah. Fifth Group. Right. You know, and but everything. You know, we didn't invent any of this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's all been around, like you said, for probably thousands of years. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, it, it's, I mean, as long it, as men. Yeah picked up stones and threw them at each other, they yeah. probably figured out the best angle with which to attack somebody yeah. to throw the stone. Yeah, yeah, and, and I understand that, I, I do understand that there's a lot of disingenuous people out there in the training community that are, you know, they are kind of just basically teaching someone else's curriculum, pretty mm -hmm. much lock, you know, lock and stock, but not giving that person any credit. That's That's wrong, you know, but for me to say, you know, later on we're going to work on some stuff and, you know, some striking and stuff like that. And if I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and every single thing, well, you know, this came from so-and-so. It almost becomes, such such. it's it's and, it's you know. like I, I want to be honorable. Mm -hmm. Like that's the mindset. I want to be honorable and make sure people don't think I borrowed this stuff. Yeah. But you almost can't have effective communication if I stop to say, well, everything I've taught you guys or said thus far in this podcast, I learned from my mother and yeah. father because they taught me how to speak. Right. So every word, yeah. you know, my third grade teacher taught me pronunciation. Right. So. Yeah. Well, and, and you've trained with a lot of great people. I've trained with a lot of great people. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's a lot, like, well, like the quote I said a, a few minutes ago, I don't remember where a lot of these things come from sometimes. Sure. It's not, you know, the, the quote stuck. 
but where it came from didn't necessarily stick. We'll Google you know? it, yeah, because and, then we'll find out. Right. Yeah. And uh, you know. I'm gonna just write it, and I'm gonna put his name behind it. Funny yeah. that you say this. So uh, Pat McNamara loves to quote Steinbeck: mm -hmm. "The mind is the ultimate weapon; all else is supplemental." Mm -hmm. I'm in a class with him. Pat says it. That was Steinbeck's quote. Yeah. The guy that wrote "Grapes of Wrath," and somebody requotes it that was in the class and wrote. Unders or you know hyphen Patrick McNamara. Yeah, and I'm like you dumb. That's like you know it's like one of the most famous American authors. And yeah. Like, and so I messaged the guy and I said I copy and it wasn't like I gotta fix this injustice. Yeah. he's just, a friend of mine. Yeah, just hey, just FYI. Yeah, yeah. like not. But we rehear things and then and that's not probably how that happens. I'm yeah. sure some Roman soldier would be like you dumb. Yeah, when I went into the. Gladiator stage, yeah. or yeah. whatever they call it. Yeah. Drew's going to edit out a lot of these m m words. <laughs> so. It happens. Yeah. It's, uh, it is interesting, though. But like you said, is then it begs the question, is the purpose to learn and train, mm -hmm. or are we going to sit here and patty cake? And, yeah. to, and pat each other on the ass. Yeah. You said this one, yeah. but Drew said this one. Right. Oh, yeah. we're so cool. Yeah. You know, I, you know, pay pay homage to your mentors and stuff like that. But you know, they got it from somewhere too. You know what we do? Our course curriculum. The back page has got about fifty names of mm -hmm. of people that teach similar material. Yeah. And it's got their name and their web address. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, here's like yeah. fifty dudes that I can tell you are awesome guys. If you run into them, go see them. Yeah. And that's my way of of saying, you know, this. So yeah, in all the lesson plans, are right. Um, you know, at my job, um, I, I have a standard. I pretty much just copy paste it for the most part. I have a standard group of references that I just put at the end of every lesson plan. Because it's the body of work that you yeah. drew from over the last twenty yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. These are the like, hey, the, you know, and I tell people, these are the people who have heavily influenced me. Yeah. You know, if if you like what I'm doing and you want to get deeper into it, go see these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a graduate of uh, Four Science Institute, yes, and so people will cite Four Science Institute, mm -hmm. and I'll say, well, that's technically true, except if you go read the Four Science Institute curriculum, which is that thick, right. they got that information from PhD so-and-so or right. Dr. so-and-so, yeah. and so they c compiled it and codified mm -hmm. it and cataloged yeah. it, and some of it's their own studies, of course, like the Tuller drill and all mm -hmm. that stuff that, yeah. that Bill Lewinsky was part of with yeah. Dennis, but you it's just them. The 21 foot rule, right? It's legit. Uh, it's a rule. It's a total rule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, if you guys don't know why he's laughing, it's because it's not really a rule. Yeah. Yeah. And it was never intended to be. No. Nope. You know, it, it's kind of like force continuums in law enforcement. You know, they were, they were never intended to influence policy, but they've made their way into policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're intended to take somebody who doesn't have any, you know, somebody coming into a new career that doesn't have any concept for and the help use them of force and help them conceptualize, you know. We talk about this a lot lately. I've been, you know, sometimes like you kind of go down like different areas of, of knowledge seeking, like this thing is intriguing, so you look for things to support or, or um, counter Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. whatever. Like so, right now, I've been thinking about what you're talking about the last six months, and there's so many of those things, and a lot of it came about talking about safety on the range, yeah. and how drills, for example, how do we teach people to draw a pistol, access the gun, clear the leather, rotate towards the target, mm -hmm. join our hands, press out. Yeah. Well, that's a very slow way of doing business. You know, if you bring the gun up and just take it to the target, it's way faster. Right. Except this is safe because now the range officer can see the guns in right. a safe direction. Yeah. So we teach people to do it. Yeah. And then, and this was where I was going with this, we create supportive data. Well, no, it's not just safe because this allows you to shoot from the hip if you have to. Yeah. And it's faster. Well, no, it's not. I mean, we can put on a timer and yeah. shoot in a second like this. Right. But we create things to support, support. it, yeah. to make it seem mm -hmm. more viable. Yeah. And then you can keep, I could think of 50 things like that. Yeah. Another, I don't need to go down the rabbit hole, but yeah. to your point, yeah. it's, well, we'll talk about that a little bit, law enforcement training. Sure. And anything that we say 
from here forward on this subject. I want to make sure anybody listening understands that it's from a perspective of trying to help people, not to insult or tear anybody down. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. Agreed, one hundred percent. Yeah. So. So yeah. upstairs, you said F that. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> that guy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, we do a, a big disservice in law enforcement. First of all, I, I, my opinion, and I don't know how you're going to work this out because there's a lot of logistics and budgets. I think everyone in law enforcement should we should pay these guys to train on the range for an hour a week and we should pay these guys to train on the mat room for an hour a week, an hour a week you know this should be an ongoing part of their regular curriculum well the very you know? simple thing is is instead of having them learn how to <clears throat> talk nice yeah. and do things like uh, deal with uh, opioid overdoses they yeah. could be doing that I mean it's yeah. not the job of law law enforcement to deal with some of those things well, yeah and you know and it's funny you know there's, there's such a push right now for like de-escalation and stuff like this and you know it certainly we don't want to escalate anything obviously that's not what i'm advocating i'm not saying de-escalation is crap but former pro fighter is uh, basically saying he wants to create street fights right exactly <laughs> it's a joke but uh you know the, the thing is and you know this. You've been, you know, you've been in the martial arts world, and you know, and I consider shooting a martial arts. You're too, damn right and, it is. And <laughs> yeah, you've been in this world, you know, your whole life too. And when you are good at something, when you're confident something, confident at something, you don't tend to overreact to situations. Yeah. You know, and I think that what we do, and it's well intentioned, but what what happens in law enforcement is right from the academy they start showing these people these videos when this of, happens to you you're going to be so out of control yeah you're not going to be able to think or the you know these 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 the, and they do happen these situations do happen obviously we wouldn't have video of them but with these these sort of routine incidences that turn into officers being murdered you know and you get people thinking like yeah every you know every every interaction i have can be my last well, that's true. Sure, that's true. But we scare the shit out of people, mm -hmm. and then we don't give them the physical skills to deal with the situation we're putting them in. So we create, we run the risk of creating an overreaction in people. I what I'm hearing here is, mm -hmm. and it's a physical mechanical skill set but it's coupled with a thought process right and, and and it's almost like we're scared to talk about certain things like what, how we think controls the outcome of our life yeah and hey instead of telling you this scary thing could happen we should tell you this could be scary but here's the we're gonna set yeah, to deal with we're that. gonna spend the next six weeks and it, for the rest of your career you're your gonna career. spend yeah. six eight hours a month doing this and as such you will develop confidence yeah. in these abilities so that if this day comes you'll be okay yeah. and you're gonna handle it in a manner that it's the best possible outcome for you right. and the victims or would be yeah. uh, bad guys so you know a good friend of mine that I train jujitsu with he's a, he's a blue belt in jujitsu now and he's a he's a sergeant on a police department and he year over year led his department in deployments of his taser he's the highest in his department is a relatively small department it's an interesting he's the highest, data point highest in deployment of tasers every year multiple years in a row began training jiu-jitsu and he's now he's now at functionally zero he's he got, might, he's he might got have, a tool to deal yeah, with it he might have one you know, one deployment a year, but you know, he's he's at functionally zero from the highest every year to functionally zero every year, and he'll tell you. You know, he'll be honest and he'll tell you. I now know when I'm really in danger. I have the confidence to deal with the situation that I didn't have before, so I would react out of fear. Talking about my buddy Z again, who's a BJJ black belt, the mm -hmm. Green Beret, probably is. <clears throat> Uh, about as competent a human as you could create. Sure. Multi-combat deployments, physically... Uh, uh, physically fit. Yeah, he's a freaking 200-pound yeah. sack of muscle, and yeah. he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu and done plenty of striking. Yeah. Um, he now runs a company called Asset. They do uh, they do training for law enforcement, training for security people. They have security people. And he's created... Uh, uh, pipeline to become one of their security people you got to be a pretty solid individual like you don't just get to pass some state requirement right. to be a security guard because he wants the people to not have to 
draw a gun or a taser. Right. And so he's created a bunch of programs that people are not wanting him to use. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's uh, uh, and we offer this training in classes. Cops can come out for free, and nobody takes him up on it because one. It breaks what they know. That's yeah. not what they didn't teach me that in the academy, or my training officer didn't teach me that, or my training sergeant. But that's the main thing. Let me teach you how to just do a knee on belly yeah. and hold this guy down right. until backup comes and you can roll him over, put some handcuffs on him instead of shooting him five times. Right. Or of course, if somebody has to get shot, they yeah. have to get yeah. shot. That's yeah. not absolutely what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. But so much of that, here's my tools. I've got a taser and I've got a pistol, and that's all I know how to do, and I'm not even confident with that. Right. Where, where's every altercation going to go? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's, I think, a huge, huge disservice that we do for the law enforcement community is we, we don't We the them, people. We, yeah. we the citizens. Yes, yeah, and, and, and the, you know, and the administrations. Which and, is you know, we, the people, yeah. hire those people, elect those people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it all comes down though. The administration is doing the will of city council, the will of county government, the mm-hmm. will of state government, and that is, I want a, I want my local cops to fill this role. Yeah, who decides that? We do. Yeah. The citizens. Yeah. I think I want a cop at the school. I think I want them to be really kind when they pull me over yeah. and not piss me off. Right. I want them to uh, have the ability to slim jim my door open. I want them to do. Uh, basic medical services. I want them to have to take homeless people that are having mental psychosis issues yeah. and get them safely mm-hmm. from their drunken or mental psychosis stupor to the hospital. Yep. Like that's not a bad thing, but if I'm doing that, I'm not yeah. doing this. Right. Yeah. And it's just you know, again, with, with the, all those things, all those other things are important. You know, the, the procedural knowledge, the law knowledge, the, the you know, the, the communicative skills. They're, they're, all those things are important. But I think if you have very physically capable people, those you're never going to have people that aren't going to are much less likely to to overreact. To so let's situation. talk about that. So when we hire now, mm-hmm. and I say we again as in society, I'm not in law enforcement, but I've worked with and around so many people that I have a pretty good understanding. Yeah. Um, we hire people, and we look at things like their credit score. We look at sure. you know we're, we're more concerned, and of course there's a good indicator if somebody's got shitty credit and they yeah. default on all their loans. You probably you know, somebody that's maybe not be trustworthy or reliable. I get the reasoning. Right. But we're more concerned with, with that than is this person physically capable of doing violence to yeah. protect the public. Are we hiring the wrong people? I posted a video a couple years ago, and I don't want to insult the woman, but a female police officer from this county walked up on a car. You probably remember when it happened. Uh, doing a check on a car parked on a gravel road. Well, the guy had just murdered an 80-some-odd-year-old woman, was on the lam. She walked up to the car. Hey, what's going on? He put a pistol in her face mm-hmm. and grabbed her and was going to kill her. And she lost it. Yeah. She, please don't hurt me, screaming at the top of her lungs. And if it wasn't for her partner that just happened to pull up, run up, and shoot this dude in the face, she was going to be gone. dead. Yeah. And she had... Mm, who knows how it would have gone if he was five more minutes on the road to get there. Right. But she had absolutely zero to say about it other than please don't kill me like I got family. Yeah. And not insulting her no, I understand. or anything yeah. in that manner. No, yeah. But you could clearly see there was nothing in the tank to deal with it. Now, what if she was the backup officer? Right. What if she what if there was children involved what if there was you know other people what if this guy was going to kill her and 10 more people yeah. and are we hiring the wrong people perhaps you know yeah. and i think you know it it's it it's, gets tougher and tougher to find people that can pass like you said all the all the qualifications that yeah. haven't haven't lived a life that would you know that would disqualify them. Mm-hmm. you know i mean we did a uh we were doing a survey for a while with all the new uh police and correctional officers that we hired at our agency, a uh, violence survey. And have you ever played contact sports? Have you ever been punched in the face? Have you ever been knocked unconscious? These were questions we were asking people on a questionnaire. It's astonishing the amount of no, 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 mm-hmm. no. Yeah, never been never been in a contact sport even. I've know? met a lot of guys that uh, the only time that they ever were involved in any type of real physical altercation is they talk about like some of the scrapping that they did in the academy, yeah. which 
from what I can gather, is some really basic hand-to-hand -hand stuff. And when you know, I know when you're only exposed to shit for a few hours, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean nothing. Right. Yeah. When you do the six-hour class, now you're certified to take dudes down. Yeah. And, well, and then we do, you, know, you mentioned the six-hour class, you know, again, we do a disservice in the way we train people. Yeah. You know, and and it's, it's out of necessity, I understand, you know, but... You know, we It'd be it, better to be an hour every an week hour every week instead of trying than, to than eight hours once every you know quarter, sometimes once every year. Now know? we do know that. If, so you're talking about data, asking people these questions. We do know that if we look, especially out here where we live, mm -hmm. uh, how often is an officer likely to be involved in a shooting or some type of yeah. of, of uh, 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 physical de deployment of force? It's pretty slim, yeah. and so how much time should we train on something that is so uh, uh, unlikely in this area? And of course, oh, it can hurt me. I want to be really good at it's it. It's not the likelihood, it's the stakes. Yeah, yeah. right. And yeah. that, But that's the problem. That's yeah. what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. We've had four officers use a gun in this city in the last hundred years. As yeah. such, why would we spend a bunch of money? Right. Till yeah. something bad happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but so many instances you just don't hear about. Mm -hmm. to, you know, I mean, you know, we look at, we don't have a ton of use of forces on, you know, if you, you take our department, you know, it's, it's, it's probably about average, but you know, like I said, we, we have a large jail, yeah. you know, over a thousand bed jail. There's use of forces constantly in there. Now they're not shootings, obviously, you know, but they're, you know, they're physically going hands on with people multiple times a day, yeah. every day. I'm sure. You know, um, so, you know, my personal record was uh, 14 uses of force in one 12-hour shift. Holy you know? crap. Yeah. You know? And that was, you know, that was some years ago. But I'm assuming now somebody could look at that and be like, well, wait a second. Is Frank here possibly you know, in, uh, a factor in this? No, sure they could look at it like that. You know, they, they absolutely they could. And, you know, um, so one of the things that you see... You guys, just so you know, he's not playing with his penis and the dog. small dog is yeah. between his leg. Yeah, it's the. You don't call your penis a small dog, do you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the uh, you know the the problem is like what what we do in you know in in a jail environment or corrections environment is they have these response teams. Yeah. You know. SRT teams. Yeah, and SRT teams and and that you know if you're one of the people that gets put on the response team, you're going to be at everything. Yeah. You know, because it's not like a patrol setting where it might be 20 minutes away or 40 yeah, you're, minutes away you're, on the other side of the county. Minute, two yeah. minute jog. Yeah, yeah, or, or less, you know, and probably two minutes for me anymore, but back then, probably, you know, <laughs> a lot less. But, you know, but yeah, so you're, you're going to be involved in everything. But sure. Yeah, yeah, I've had that backfire on me too, though, where you get something, you have a questionable use of force, and then the administrators start looking at it like, you know, this guy's in a lot of stuff. Well, hold on. He's in a lot of stuff because mm -hmm. you put him in a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know. So. I think the broad point here, and this goes for anybody, civilian, military, law enforcement, first responder, school teacher, parent. When you're the the more you know, from awareness to evasion to de-escalation mm -hmm. to other levels of force, yeah. the less you'll probably need it because you recognize when it's real and when yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah when uh, the danger's real. I'm doing some stuff at the hospital and mm -hmm. there's a belligerent uh, woman with dementia. Yeah. A couple people they wanted to get the security people to like tie her down, and I'm like, let me let me talk to her. Yeah. She was having a total disconnect from reality and yeah. was angry and mm -hmm. I chatted with her and they got to put IVs in her and make her go to sleep and everybody was happy was but they were going to like you know she's yeah. being combative yeah. and of course the security people well it's been boring sitting here all day yeah, let's, right. let's get this let's done this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it's an 86 year old woman right. <laughs> let's yeah. chill out yeah. what is she going to do right yeah, yeah like yeah, all let's... 90 pounds yeah. of her yeah, yeah you know, part of that is you got you don't want them to hurt themselves. Right. And, yeah, but let's slow this down a little. Yeah, yeah. yeah we don't yeah. need to. We don't need to go to that place. And I think uh, that that's uh, too often what happens. Mm -hmm. The uh, the shooting that happened in Florida last year. I forget the case name. Uh, you probably saw the footage. Dude rolls up to a convenience store gas station, sees a car parked in the handicap space. Okay. 
realizes it's not a handicap licensed car, starts yelling at the female who's in the vehicle, get your mm-hmm. car out of the space, yeah. sick of you people parking here. Her husband comes out of the store to see a guy yelling at his wife, comes up, get the hell away from the car. Dude falls on the ground, draws a pistol, shoots him in the chest. Yep. He stumbles back in the one. store and dies. Yeah. They immediately, not immediately, but the sheriff's office said that it was Florida staying your ground law, all was well. Well, they yeah. start investigating this guy. He had... Um, Numerous times brandished or made a threat of yeah. using a weapon in yeah. similar situations like road rage and stuff. Yeah. And they end up the guy's in prison now. I think yeah. he got I think they gave him forty years or yeah. twenty years. And you look at that, and this was I think is a good I think it's a good analogy. You look at it and you think like, first of all, are you the parking lot police? Right. And second of all, like the guy pushed you down and then made twenty feet of distance yeah. and that was what yeah. Is he wasn't advancing, the yeah, guy was retreating, no, yeah. and there was no more force against him, and that's kind of how they got him. But yeah. uh, why even be there? Yeah. Why are you screaming at a woman in a car? Yeah. I mean, if anything, hey, I notice you don't have handicap tags. Is this, you know, I blew my knee out. Whatever. Yeah. Like, why are you? It, yeah. it, it, and I think that goes for law enforcement, too. Do you know who I am? Yeah. I don't know. Who are you? Yeah. Some dope yeah. that my tax dollars pay? They love when I say that too. Yeah, that that one goes over well. You don't pay my check, actually. I do. If you understand the funding and how it goes, so yeah, you like that. I I, pay your check. Why don't I? Don't live in your area, but that's fine. I'll. I'll (laughs) (laughs) But but I think guys, I think like right there, just so many situations are created that. There's something different than a true criminal, but yeah. there's so many situations that escalate into something because of just how people's attitudes uh, yeah. are, are presented and yeah. kind of a different thought process than the one we were on. No, but, you know, it's that, that, like you said, that, you know, the only thing that's really in danger right now is your ego. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, and I tell people that all the time when I do, you know, self-defense clinics and stuff like that is like, look. You know, if you can just walk away, you're not defending yourself. You're yeah, only you, defending you, your ego. Yeah, the, the goal was met. Yeah. Which begs the question, what is the goal? Is the goal for you to tase somebody, shoot somebody, mm-hmm. get in a fist fight, or is the goal to do your job, which is to protect the public and your partners and and take bad people to justice or protect yourself and your family? And if you're in doing something that escalates needless violence then right. you're not doing right. your goal yeah yeah we're not working towards your goal yeah for sure and you know that's uh you know i think that's just it though if you can you know the confidence you know the people that are they're confident in their abilities are they're not going to overreact as, as, as easily I'm not going to say there never are but they're you know um they're going to be l- less likely to make those fear-based reactions or those you know you're you're insulting my Mm-hmm. You know, my manhood. You're insulting my ego. And I think any know? dude listening's been there where somebody's, you've been in, I had a guy the other day, I passed him yeah. in a completely legal, legitimate way. He was driving like 20 miles an hour under the speed limit, mm-hmm. kind of swervy, broad daylight, two-lane country road. I passed him. I was doing 55, 60 miles an hour. He catches up to me and rides my tail. Yeah. Okay, well, that's stupid, whatever. Sure. So I keep driving. Eventually, he turns off, and before he turns off, he just lays on his horn for 100 yards. Yeah. And I thought, God, I would love just yeah. to go drive down to wherever he's going and get out and walk up and yeah. bitch slap him. Sure. And, of course, I'm not going no, to. No, you're not going to, but, but you like, have that, that moment. Yeah, like, and it's yeah. just so goofy. So, like, 20-year-old me probably would have locked the brakes up and been yeah. like, what? Yeah. What? Right. And yeah. we do that though. absolutely, yeah. And no. so many people justify it too. Yeah. yeah, but if you if you have that, you know, you know, the thing for me was like, you know, I, guys would call me out when they challenge me. I used to be like, I don't have anything to prove. I've proven it before. They challenge you because they knew you were a fighter. Sometimes, sometimes I would get that a little bit. Um, now, generally, it's like especially with like the, you know, the inmate population and stuff. When I said, because now I'm a full time training, but when I was working, you know, you got to be stupid. To, uh, I mean, even if I'm a good fighter, I don't want to, like, get my teeth broken or... Uh, well, I think, you know, they get... It, it, sometimes, too, they get, you know, they figure they get credit if they even... Okay. You know... 
tried. Tried or challenged me, yeah. you know. Yeah. Man, that guy was scared of shit. I called him out, you know. You see how he backed down from me? Or, you know, that You type probably of thing. would back down from me. Yeah. So. Oh, I, well, I did. If, unless I had to, you know, if I, if I had to put my hands on him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate that stuff. I hate it. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah, I hate that stuff. This OC spray. Yeah, that's brutal. But there's another, you know, there's another thing that I think is, dude. I, I think it's uh, Highland Park, Illinois. I'm over there at Ravinia uh, a couple years ago with my wife, and I'm talking to a couple coppers, and I'm like, "Damn, you got a lot of stuff on." Yeah. They literally, the, because of the community there, uh, they wanted them to have like every means of non-lethal yeah. force possible, mm -hmm. like. That's crazy. Yeah. All the gear that they made them walk Same around theory, with. Yeah. It's like, how about instead of all that, like you said, you know, do some actual training. Yeah. Because um, then it's a, how often have you even trained with all that shit that's right. on you? Yeah. And what if it doesn't work? Yeah. You know? And, you know, I don't know. I'd have to look. I don't, I don't know exactly the population that is not, you know, not really affected by OC. But mm -hmm. I can tell you that it's always the guys you need it on that it doesn't work on. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, it's never the Which for you people listening, if that's your go to, I gave my wife some pepper spray. Yeah. Hey, great. You know, I, I I do. I tell people that a lot. You know, I I have a friend. I carry my wife, some. Yeah, my wife my wife jogs all the time. You know, she doesn't want to carry a gun when she jogs. And I just have to carry some pepper spray with her. You know, it's probably a good idea anyway, especially where they live, you know, one of the yeah, I carry it because we got a couple dogs in the neighborhood yeah. that want to run out and I'd rather Yeah, I'd rather spray, spray it than shoot, shoot him or them. kick him hard, you yeah, know, and hurt absolutely. him. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's a great. I'm not not against it. I'm not, I don't tell people not to use it. But what if it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. yeah. Jared Reston, his story. He tried to tase the dude that he yeah. got in a fight. That got in a fight with him subsequently had to kill. Yeah. But he deployed the taser and no yeah. go. It didn't work. Yeah. Well, you talked about for science earlier, you know, and they've got some good some good numbers on it. I, I don't want to quote the numbers because I'm not going to remember them off the top of my head. But it's you know it's fairly fairly. Handguns are are fairly ineffective in as being man stoppers. They're super know? ineffective. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you know, and again, I don't want, I don't want to quote the numbers, but it's it's pretty small. If you uh, you guys listening, if you're interested, Google Force Science, and then you could also look up um, uh, Claude Werner's study and uh, um, Greg Elifritz, yeah. his his uh, study that he did for years, all of the. Um, handgun shootings that yeah. he documented. Yeah, you look at it, and yeah, this yeah. is not a. We did the podcast with uh, who's his name? Put that whole magazine of uh, 357 Sig into that guy's chest, and the guy was going to take the gun away from him. Mm -hmm. He had like a eight shot group of 357 yeah. Sig. I mean, the guy was dead standing, but yeah. still combative, still fighting. Yeah, 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 yeah like sure. it's, He was hopped up on drugs, though. Yeah, but that's yeah. the point. Yeah, that's the so, point. Is you don't know. Yeah, yeah, he's those. People are out there, and it's Michael Myers up on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're gonna uh, we're going to uh, throw some pads on, I guess, and you're gonna show me a couple things, which is exciting. Yeah. And uh, by the way, we train nude here. This is old school Roman. Yeah. 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 Of course. Did you know that was a thing, Drew? What's that? Um, I'm sure you know about this. Like some of the old uh, uh, Greek and Roman training. Uh, schools, you came in naked, so if you like, and it was like, it's this is it, it's all I got. Mm -hmm. So like, if you like weren't even man enough to come in there, you weren't, you weren't allowed. It's just me. This is it. Just me. Okay. I ask people all the time if you had something to pass on. Could be about baking. Mm -hmm. Could be about fighting. Could be about anything. If you had something to pass on to the folks listening or watching that would never get a chance to meet you in person, or maybe this is the only time they'll ever hear the sound of your voice, yeah. what would you say to them? Uh, you know, learn how to take care of yourself. Learn how to take care of your family. Sit. Yeah, sure. Sit. Learn how to take care of yourself. Learn how to take care of your family. Uh, you know, don't stress about these things. Don't be paranoid about it. But, um, you know, Know what's out there, and and just be a good person. You know, be a decent person. That right there stops so many problems. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're not a dickhead, yeah. And most people kind of like, not that not that they don't notice you, but you don't become a uh, uh, part of somebody's argument when you're nice to people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's too easy. Hey guys, we appreciate you watching. Uh, Google him, Bryce Frank. You'll see some fight uh, uh, footage. You will. Uh, You'll see some stuff if, if you Google it after we're done here that we'll put up. Yeah. But um, 
check him out. Read his fight record. See if what he said is true. Because uh, he could be lying. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Hey, we appreciate you watching. If you enjoy these podcasts, share them. Uh, CarryTrainer.com has got a full list of our classes coming up. S12 is coming this December. It's going to be badass. Uh, Paul Sharp will be there. Andy Hughes will be there. Uh, Don Deo, Joel Gupton, and Instructor Z and myself and the folks from Impact Shooting Center. And, of course, we're going to have Chef Kent and Emmy out there cooking some amazing food. Be well. And don't be dickheads. Yeah. Oh, 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 you got to sign this. All right. And you put the date on it, too. Sign it anywhere you want. Anywhere I want. Anywhere you want. All right. We'll go right up here. Oh, that's that. I don't care. I'd never tell anybody where to sign it. Keep punching. Is that how you would sign um, autographs? Yeah, whatever they wanted. Yeah, whatever they Break wanted. Write the date on there. Oh, yeah. What is the date? 21. 10 21 19. Thank you, Drunus. Visit our website, carrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Carry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.